Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Jackie M. I'm a former Malaysian restauranteur based here in Sydney, Australia. I was born in Malaysia in a town called Seremban. And Seremban is actually quite close to Kuala Lumpur. It's about uh, 40 well, it's about uh, 40 miles south of Kuala Lumpur. See how old I am? I'm, I still use uh, imperial measurements. <laughs> um, but because of our proximity to Kuala Lumpur, a lot of the food is fairly similar. And it was actually quite an eye-opener when I left Malaysia as a teenager, came to Australia, and then subsequently was exposed to Malaysian food from other parts of Malaysia and Singapore and all that. I realized how or the one dish can mean something else in a different part of Malaysia. I gave the example of Penang Cha Kui Tiao, of Cha Kui Tiao last broadcast where I said that my version of Cha Kui Tiao that I grew up knowing was quite dark. Uses, uh, it used these uh, flat, broad cut rice noodles and also it usually had some Hokkien mee, some yellow noodles thrown into the mix as well. And then when I came to Australia and finally decided to really learn how to make it myself, I was quite horrified when I dug up a cookbook and it had cha kui tiao, but it was really pale and it looked like pad thai to me. And that was actually Penang cha kui tiao. And I was quite convinced that the whoever published the, that particular cookbook was a charlatan, right? But I think that's the story with a lot of overseas Malaysians who left Malaysia from wherever they are, wherever they were in, uh, in Malaysia and then went overseas. And then subsequently when they visit Malaysian restaurants overseas, they get really disappointed when things don't turn out to be the same versions as what they grew up knowing. And the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to assume that uh, whoever cooked that particular meal was uh, a fake, right? So I've kind of like caught both sides of the... Because <laughs> I used to own a restaurant. Like I said, I've sold food here in Australia for decades now. Um, and um, so I, I, every now and then I do get people kind of like uh, challenge me on my particular version, my particular take of certain dishes. But if you don't know, uh, insofar as my uh, philosophy, my point of view with food, uh, first of all, I don't eat pork, all right? So part of what I do um, means that uh, well, first of all, my parents used to be hawkers and I have a, a very close affinity to hawker food. That's the particular type of cuisine, Malaysian cuisine, that I really aim when I set out to, when I quit my IT consultancy to get into food. That was really kind of like what I set out to do, to recreate all these hawker dishes that I grew up loving. Um, not necessarily every single thing, but a lot of them, right? So all your typical, usual suspect, like. Uh, Roti canai, chakui dia, satay, nasi lemak, and uh, rojak, and uh, Hainanese chicken rice, and all that. So, I set out to learn popia, how to make your own popia skin, and everything. So, I basically set out to make all of that. But um, I, I make them pork free because I don't eat pork. And the other thing is that um, I, I tend to find that hawker food is quite niche, right? I, I, I targeted hawker food because I found that very few people knew how to cook them, right? So, even professionally trained chefs in Malaysia, when they go overseas and they open their own restaurants, they are almost invariably not hawker food specialists because the whole hawker food culture, the whole street food culture in Malaysia is quite different. You don't go to culinary school to learn those, right? You learn it as a trade um, and, and, and so on. Uh, just let me, where's the Zoom link? Okay, uh, just give me a second. It's, uh, uh, it's not a Zoom session. Is a live video you can find at com slash Jackie M Food. Okay, sorry. Every single time I do a live broadcast, people wonder where to find me, how to find me. They want to like join me on screen. But um, for what it's worth, guys, like I said last week, these broadcasts are kind of like me to you. They're like doing a live video sort of thing. They're different to my Zoom meetings, which are a private kind of like a group meeting okay so you don't get a zoom link you just go to my facebook page which is facebook.com slash jackie m food or uh in fact the best bet if you can't find me is to sign up to my facebook group called jackie m's malaysian street food kitchen just look up jackie m's malaysian street food kitchen on facebook and you just send a request to join the group and that's where all my live cooking videos that group was specifically set up so that everyone can easily find my live cooking videos there all right so that's the whole point of it uh but yeah thanks again so much for joining me and uh, again say hello let me know where you're watching from okay so um 
that's kind of like where my headspace is. And also insofar as these live cook-alongs and also when I teach people how to cook and when I publish recipes and all that, I simplify them a lot, right? Um, partly because of my own experience running a food business in Australia where skills are very scarce, it's very hard to find labor. I ended up having to take a lot of um, liberties with shortcuts so that I don't end up spending five hours stirring the pot to produce something, you know, uh, for my customers because there's only so many hours in a day. So a lot of my techniques uh, apply a lot of shortcuts and I think that actually lends itself to people who are short on time attempt, uh, you know trying to cook Malaysian food at home all right so you'll find that uh, and in particular with this particular series of cook-alongs because they were I mean obviously the lockdown um, situation is easing up in some parts of the world not necessarily in all um, but it was basically motivated by the whole lockdown situation where people were stuck at home um, so I wanted to make this easy and accessible okay but having rambled all that uh, just around you okay it's 10 o'clock now <laughs> all right uh, I, I wanted to actually go I give you guys a little bit of time to settle in because I started a little bit early. So what we're making today, there's something called KL Hokkien Mee. And if you grew up in Seremban, near KL, you would know that you didn't grow up calling it KL Hokkien Mee, you just called it Hokkien Mee, okay? Um, and it's one of those dishes that, like I said, as your horizons expanded, you realize that actually Hokkien Mee means something else when you go to Singapore, when you go to Penang and so on and so forth. What is Hokkien? For those of you who are not Malaysian and or maybe not Chinese, Hokkien is a particular dialect group, all right? So Malaysian, the Malaysian Chinese are broken up into all kinds of different dialect groups. They come from all different parts of China. Our, our ancestors before us came from all different parts of China. And by and large, we've actually retained a lot of our dialectual um, leanings, our, our, our food, our culture and all that, all right? So uh, the, I, I'm, I, I'm hypothesizing here a little bit uh, as to why Hock and Me means something in KL to, uh, to something in Penang to something in Singapore. And I would assume that the first person, you know, to open a hawker stall in Kuala Lumpur who happened to be Hokkien to cook something like this, um, he just decided to call it Hokkien noodles because he was Hokkien, right? Just like maybe some Irishman going to Dubbo or something like that, you know, might open a bakery and call it like Irish, whatever, Irish pancakes or something like that, his own take on something, right? So, and then maybe another Irishman goes to goes to Sydney and opens a, <laughs> a cafe and makes his own Irish uh, pancakes and it means something completely different, right? So there's actually no uh, technical reason why something would be called a particular name except for the fact that it identifies with the person who's cooking it, okay? So, um, but uh, Hokkien noodles in Kuala Lumpur are uh, basically a really dark, rich, braised noodle dish and it uses, look, um, and that's the other thing as well, a lot of Malaysians will complain when they live overseas, like I do, <laughs> that the kind of noodles you can buy in Australia and you know, overseas, the texture is a little bit different, all right? It feels a little, little bit different, it, um, it behaves a little bit different. So it's a little bit of an ongoing experimental process in terms of what noodles work best, okay? So generally, Hokkien noodles, you go to the shops, and I would tell people, look for what's labeled as Hokkien noodles in your shops, okay? Now, uh, having said that, the typical Hokkien noodles that I find in Australia in these supermarket shelves tend to be too yellow and they're too dense, okay? So they don't absorb the flavors of the, 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 the dark sauces as effectively. Um, so a lot of time you end up with like a, a glob of like dark saucy noodles, but the noodles still look quite yellow, okay? That's not the visual aesthetic you want to achieve. Uh, now, um, my friend Lily Ng, who's also a Serumbanian, based over in Colorado. She's got a fantastic food blog. And when I started out, I used to pick up a lot of her cooking uh, tips and all that. She felt, in fact, like uh, if you were living overseas, you might want to actually try making kale hokkien noodles using udon noodles, okay? That's why in my ingredients list, if you signed up to be notified uh, about the event, uh, the ingredients list actually mentioned you can use udon noodles, okay? Because udon noodles, uh, have some level of por you know uh, porosity, sort of word, uh, that, that allows it to absorb the flavors a little bit better. Now, what I'm using today, I've never used this. Okay, this is actually courtesy of Chang's. Okay, Chang's here in Australia. Chang's is famous for their sesame oil. I'm a big fan of their sesame oil. A few months ago, they sent out some noodles to me. Okay, so this is what they look like. Okay, to me, uh, visually, it looks better. 
than your typical what's label. Okay, this actually says uh, shelf fresh noodles. It actually says hockey and style. Okay, so we're, we're tracking right here. Um, so they're beet noodles and they look less yellow and I like that about it. Okay, so let's see how we go with these. And like I said, these are shelf stable, which means they do not need to be refrigerated. They're long life noodles. And I've been sitting like in my pantry for quite a few months, but they're still within the expiry date. So we're good. Let's see how we go with that. Now, uh, again, because we're keeping in the spirit of the lockdown theme, and the fact that I don't eat pork, right? Uh, one of the big things about kale Hokkien noodles, uh, people rave on about the pork lard that goes into it, okay? Again, I don't eat pork, so I don't put pork lard or anything in it. And funnily enough, when I was in KL last, I actually brought together a group of foodies, Malaysian foodies, at this gathering where we all brought a dish, a dish each from hawker stores, our favorite hawker stores, and served it to the group. And I went and picked up KL Hokkien noodles from a place in Ampang, uh, courtesy of my friend uh, Christopher. And I told the guy, please don't put any pork in it, no lot, lot, nothing. So he did a special one for me. And I brought it to the event and all these food bloggers who are usually quite snobbish about their whatever, they did not miss the lack of pork. And in fact, they thought it was the best dish of the night. Okay, so uh, to the Chinese who are very hung up about um, <clears throat> messing around with <laughs> with their pork quota and stuff like that because I cop a little bit of, uh, of it. Let's uh, actually start by um, mincing some garlic. Okay, so we've got some garlic over here. So to the Chinese who think that uh, you can't cook a, an authentic hawker dish without the use of pork, uh, that to me is one example of how that's not necessarily the case, okay? So again, we've got some garlic here. The ingredients are actually quite simple. The one thing that you do want here is this one here, okay? It's called uh, cooking caramel or caramel masaka. And I've covered this in my first live cook along uh, a few weeks ago. I started this nine weeks ago. This is cook along number nine. Uh, the first one I think was mi hai lam, okay? Hainanese noodles. Uh, and in that, I actually talked a little bit about this particular sauce. But um, and I showed you in that video. If you don't, if you aren't able to get a hold of this sauce, how to make your own? Okay. But in a nutshell, it's made from using palm sugar, dark palm sugar, and that's uh, melted and kind of like scorched, and then with soya sauce added to it. Okay, and you thicken it up. But uh, go back to my mi hai lam cook along, and you'll see how I made it. Okay. But so we won't go through that again today, but this let's talk about it in a little bit. I'm just chopping this up and also the kind of ingredients that go into this typically like again, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you want pork or chicken slices again. I, I don't have either. I mean, obviously I, I wouldn't use pork. I don't have chicken slices. I'm going to use some prawns. Prawns would usually go into it. And the third thing that goes into it are fish cakes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use fish balls. These are cuttlefish fish balls. I can make my own fish cake, but I can't be bothered. <laughs> but uh, maybe in a separate broadcast, okay? So a lot of the time, I would buy some fish bowls or cuttlefish bowls in the freezer section on my Asian grocery store, and then just use them as fish cake. Okay, why not? Let's do the last one. <laughs> uh, make your own noodle. Definitely will taste better. Yeah, actually, Elizabeth, you're right. I actually... the Last time I made this, and this isn't something that I make <laughs> as a, on a regular basis, I have to admit. But the last time I made this, I actually made my own noodles, okay? So you can make, the, these are wheat noodles, and um, I, I made my own noodles, and they're like, they, they turned out quite beautiful. And the other thing I want to mention is, as well, if you follow my website, jackiem.com.au, I've got like oh, nearly 400, probably around 400, maybe more, recipes there, right? Um, but that website's been around for 10 plus years. Now, I want to mention that uh, I had an early iteration of Kale Hokkien Mee, there where I showed you how I used to make it and it contained oyster sauce and it, it also included um, thickening up the sauce using some starch, okay? Uh, since I went to KL uh, to have this gentleman's, uh, it's called uh, uh, Fatsaya, <laughs> Fatty's, Fatty's KL Hokkien noodles, the one that he cooked that was pork free for me. Uh, I saw how he did it and he, 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 he basically told me how he did it and he does not use oyster sauce and he doesn't need any thickener. Okay, so we're going to do it his style today. <clears throat> and um, and it's really cool, okay? 
what really struck out to me the way he did it was okay so usually you would use toy sum which is um not this this gaylan okay but again keeping with the lockdown um, theme we're not going to be too fussy about using exact ingredients we're just using what you have at home in your pantry okay so we've got our long life noodles we're going to peel some prawns okay and again i would remove the head and if you've seen my previous broadcast um i don't break off the head like a lot of aussies do i kind of like uh because <laughs> I'm Asian and I'm, I want to get the best amount of uh, seafood out of um, my budget. What I do is, okay, I leave the little tail on at the end, especially if I'm doing this for my business. Uh, the, the tail makes it, look, makes it look bigger and makes it look nice, okay? Just uh, cut it down the middle to pull out the vein, okay? So you've got uh, something that's cut up like this. But I'll just show you again how you peel the head off. Okay, again, like I said, I've seen a lot of Aussies, they just break it off here. Okay, when you do that, you lose all the prawn uh, meat that's stored in and around the head. Okay, so what you want to do is just see where the prawn is uh, with the head. You just tilt it up over here and then just break it off at the tip. Okay, and then you've got this and you've still got the feelers underneath it. So just turn it around, just lift it up, okay, and peel it off like this. Okay, so it gives you this much more prawn meat that would have otherwise ended up in the head, okay? And if you're Aussie, you'll probably throw out a head at that point. Done. <laughs> All right, save it in the... Even even with this uh, head that doesn't have any meat in it, save it, okay? And use it to make my prawn noodle soups uh, also from my one of my recent cook-alongs, okay? So we're going to do, say, about four or five prawns or so. But yeah, this is a fairly simple dish uh, if you're attempting this. So one thing that I'm just uh, trying to figure out if I should attempt is the chili sauce that goes with it, okay? In Kuala Lumpur, the KL Hokkien noodles. Uh, chili sauce has a little bit of blachan, shrimp paste in it. And um, I'll see how we go with this in any case. Otherwise, any kind of chili sauce will look decent with this, okay? Now, uh, remember I said that uh, Hokkien noodles, Hokkien mee, means different stuff in different parts of our part of the world. In Penang, it means prawn noodle soup, okay? What I made a couple of weeks ago. What we call hamin in Penang, they call it Hokkien noodles, okay? Uh, in Singapore, Hokkien, Hokkien noodles is, again, different. It's actually a stir-fried dish, okay? It's a pale stir-fried dish that uses the uh, uh, wheat noodles plus vermicelli, okay? And speaking of vermicelli or rice noodles or rice sticks, uh, one of my community members of my Malaysian Street Food Kitchen, uh, like I said, go and send a joint request if you're not already a member of the Malaysian Street Food Kitchen. We have a lot of fun there. We share uh, food photos, food recipes, uh, and also once a week on Saturday night at the moment, but it can change around because we want to accommodate people who don't live in our time zone. We actually have a community meetup via Zoom. So that particular one is via Zoom, okay? Uh, that's a private community meetup. Meet and we just banter, we get to know our community members, and we just basically wax a lyrical about Malaysian food and growing up in Malaysia and living overseas as a Malaysian, all this good stuff. It's really good fun. So make sure you join that. Um, and so we've got this. Okay, I, I'm not going to use our <laughs> I'm only making one serve. We've got the vegetables, we've got the prawns, we've got the garlic. Okay, you can mince the garlic a little bit more if you want. Okay, so let's put this aside and let's pull out my wok or my pan. Right, so we're using this. Uh, so it's so difficult to get good quality. Chinese vegetable. Yeah, it depends on where you go, right? You go to, usually if you look for Chinese vegetable in your typical Western store, it's either overpriced or it looks really sad, like it's been sitting on the shelves for like a week and a half. Uh, so you do need to track down the Asian grocery stores that go through a lot of these. Um, the texture of Hokkien noodles is so bad. The texture of Hokkien noodles in Australia is so bad. It's totally different, right? You see what I mean? So, like I said, you know, uh, part of the trick that Fei Jai taught me, uh, the Mr. K.O. Hokkien noodles, <laughs> Fei Jai taught me was to actually braise it for a long time. And um, that's something I never used to do when I make K.O. Hokkien noodles, okay? So we're going to do that today. 
uh, I, I always worry when I braise anything for too long, especially when you're braising things like noodles that they'll fall apart, okay? But uh, seemed to work for him, so we're gonna do that. And the other thing I wanna mention, I lost my train of thought earlier uh, about vermicelli. Works really well for this dish according to one of my community members, okay? Uh, and that actually makes sense because part of the charm of kale Hokkien noodles is uh, how the sauce gets absorbed by the noodles. So it produces a really flavorsome, rich, dark uh, noodle dish, okay? Um, but let's get started. I'm just heating up this pan a little bit. Okay, we want a little bit of oil. And if you've got stock, if you've got unseasoned stock, uh, use that. I usually do, but I just didn't want to defrost it. Um, when I run my pop-up store, my Char Kway pop-up store, I always end up with like tons of like unseasoned chicken stock because I use a lot of chicken in my Char Kway Tiao and I have to actually, um, I have to sous vide cook them which produces some chicken juices, okay? So I always have a lot, but then um, because of the whole lockdown and all that, I had to freeze them and then when they're frozen and then you try and defrost them, they fall apart. It makes it really hard. And Chong, how are you? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're just heating up this pan here, so we've got all the stuff ready. So again, these noodles are courtesy of uh, Chang's. Chang's produces like beautiful Asian sauces like uh, the sesame oil and all that. So um, I was quite surprised when they actually sent me through some of their noodles. Uh, but these you will not find in the fridge section of your store, okay? These are shelf, shelf fresh, okay? So it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Uh, but like I said, apparently according to Lily over in uh, Colorado, um, udon noodles is a good option to go with, okay? And ultimately you can make your own noodles, which I have done in the past as well for this particular dish. Uh, but generally your typical Hokkien noodle, what's labeled as Hokkien noodle that looks super yellow at your Asian grocery store, I don't, I, I'm not the biggest fan of that for this particular dish, okay? Um, yeah, anyway, okay, let's put some oil in here. And also the other thing I want to mention as well uh, is while we're doing this is that a lot of people overuse or overhype the the, the, the concept of uh, wok here, which is uh, the breath of the wok, all right? That, that scorched flavor that is produced from stir fries and all that, okay? Now I was gonna mention that in my opinion, wok hei has its uses and we love like noodles that have that nice sorry my, my phone thinks i'm talking to it again um i i think people will like apply the concept of wok hei too broadly to everything that's asian okay it doesn't work that way okay wok hei really only is important if you are doing a scorched noodle dish which this is not okay so don't try and achieve wok hei when you're doing Okay, or Hokkien noodles. So I'm putting water in here, whereas if you have like unseasoned stock, use that, okay? It's particularly chicken stock. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. Like I said, this is labeled cooking caramel. Uh, there are a couple of brands out now because I've been harping about this for years and years in Australia. A lot of Aussies confuse this with kichap manis, okay, which is sweet soya sauce. This is not kichap manis. Uh, the reason for it, I think, is because Aussies know Bali very well. They know Indonesian food quite well, and Indonesian food uses a lot of kichap manis, okay? This is not kichap manis. This is darker, much, much darker, and much thicker, and a lot less sweet, okay? So we're putting this in. And this, when we were growing up, was called dark soya sauce or thick soya sauce, okay? But nowadays, when you go to your, when you go shopping, it no longer is labeled dark soya sauce, it's labeled cooking caramel, okay? So it's a branding thing, it's a, I don't know why they do it, but if you look for dark soya sauce at your supermarket shelf now, it actually means something different, okay? Dark soya sauce now means uh, light soya sauce, but darker and more, more, more rustic, okay? <laughs> Which means that it's runny like uh, thin soya sauce, and it's salty like thin soya sauce, okay? So if you were to replace this with your dark soya sauce of today, at least here in Australia, just remember to use less because it will be a lot saltier, okay? So let's throw in the noodles. And if 
you're using vermicelli, you'll want to pre-soak it. Okay, so these are the noodles. Let's throw it in. Let's throw in the other packet as well, okay? So these noodles, like I said, right off the bat, you can see that they're less yellow. Okay. So, so far, we've got the garlic. We've got the dark soy sauce, aka cooking caramel, aka thick soy sauce. Okay, so some cookbooks will have it labeled as thick soy sauce. That's how I used to write my recipes. I call it thick soy sauce. Um, then I have to go back and change them to cooking caramel, which is to me still sounds really weird. Okay, I remember when I put out my cookbook a few years ago, and I my 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 editor was actually American and she was so confused. She said, what the hell is caramel sauce doing in a, a savory noodle dish? You know, she said, because to Aussies, to Americans, to the rest of the world, caramel sauce is something you pour on your banana pancakes or something, you know? Uh, <laughs> so it is very confusing. Okay. So we're going to actually bring this to a, a simmer. This is a braised dish. So, and you just keep braising it. Okay. So we've got the uh, Cindy. Hey, when I first time in Singapore Hawker Centre, I ordered Hock and Me when the auntie served me a plate of white noodle. I said, no, I didn't order this. <laughs> See what I mean? See, even we Asians do not know this sort of stuff. In Singapore, okay, uh, Hock and Me means completely something else, okay? Now, we want some sugar in this, okay? So a little bit of sugar. A, a little bit more than a little bit. <laughs> um, and then we want a little bit of chicken powder and Fei Zai, my, my Hawker buddy over in Ampang who made that beautiful Okay, our Hokkien noodle, pork free. He uses chicken powder as well, okay? I keep telling people that uh, sometimes we Westerners, right, especially, and I guess Asians living overseas, they get a little bit like, I, I guess, um, they get a little bit aspirational about Asian cooking. They get a little bit, uh, rom they romanticize the whole concept of Asian and Southeast Asian cooking to the point where they think that we do everything by mortar and pestle and we, you know, we cook over charcoal fire and all that, right? Look, guys, in Malaysia, we're very practical, okay? Uh, we, you know, chefs in Malaysia don't have a problem with, like, uh, flavor enhancers like chicken powder, okay? So if you go, if you, if you show up at a, uh, which I, I, I do a lot because part of what I do is travel and collaborate with brands and with hotel chains and with chefs to uh, showcase their cooking, right? Invariably, when you go to a Malaysian like professional kitchen, uh, their mise en place, which is what they have in place in, to use for their cooking, they would have, uh, you know, a, a, a Westerner's uh, mise en place might include like pepper and salt and olive oil or something like that, but a uh, Malaysian one invariably will have like oyster sauce, soy sauce, uh, and chicken powder, okay? I've seen that so many times, but it's almost like a dirty little secret because people don't like to admit, especially when you're actually doing something that will uh, be used to showcase, uh, you know, certain aspects of a brand. They, you know, they know that Westerners are leery about the idea of having something like uh, chicken powder in their food, okay? Because um, most of the chicken powders we use actually contain MSG, okay. <laughs> um, hey, Lynn, how are you? I haven't, sorry, I haven't had a chance to catch up with you. And Janet, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> but yeah, guys, uh, do me a favor and share this out to uh, your your friends or your the Facebook groups that you're a member of, uh, and that way they can catch these broadcasts and catch some cooking tips. Okay. So the way Fei does this. He just braises this, braises this, braises this, and reduces it till, till it thickens. I'm going to put some pepper in here as well. Andrew, wish I could get the TST cooking, car cooking caramel. Yeah, make your own. <laughs> you saw my broadcast on Mi Hai Lam to show you how to make it. Okay, to be fair, if you make your own, it, uh, you know, there are other stuff in here to make it as dark as it is. When you make your own, it won't be quite so dark, right? But it's just a matter of playing around with the flavors. But the idea, if you were to make it, is to, you actually want to burn the sugar that you're using, okay? I use dark Malaysian palm sugar, melt it, and actually burn it. You know, you create that, that, that like, you know, uh, that scorch burn 
effect and then you add the soy sauce and you and you mix it up okay not too much soy sauce you don't want it outright salty okay uh, there's some saltiness in it there's some sweetness in it but not too much of either okay so you keep reducing this if you were using vermicelli this might speed it up because vermicelli uh, rice noodles soak up sauce really really well okay you see it's sticking up very very well here let's just taste test this Hey Jin, good to see you. I hope you can join us tonight with our, let's put a little bit more soy sauce, but just be a little bit careful. I have a tendency to over salt, over flavor, over season my food, but um, just remember that this needs to reduce some more. So uh, the end result is meant to be a dish that's not saucy, okay? It, it's got some sauce, like, like really dark coating of sauce, but it should not be swimming in sauce per se, okay? And that's something that I used to do actually admittedly with my kale hock and me okay that it was a little bit more saucy but uh, the way Fei Jai does it is that you you know all the sauce is all soaked up in the noodles okay and let's put in the vegetables and again I'm using Kai Lan instead of Choi Sam um, Kai Lan uh, which are Chinese broccoli they have very sturdy stems so I'll put the stem in first and just keep cooking it okay And if you want the recipe, guys, don't forget you need to sign up to my email list, bit.ly slash Jackie M. Cook Along, all lowercase. Jackie is spelled J A C K I E, okay? People still spell my name wrong to this day. J A C K I E M. Cook Along, all one word, uh, bit.ly, B I T dot L Y slash Jackie M. Cook Along is my email list for my, uh, to get notifications about my cook alongs and also to get the recipes afterwards, okay? Again, you see how it's reduced even more. Let's put in the leaves now, okay? Now, I have to admit, Fei Jai puts the leaves in a lot sooner, okay? I personally, I actually, one of the first mistakes I made as a kid helping my stepmom in the kitchen in Malaysia was to overcook some Chinese greens so they tasted like chemical. So ever since then, I've been very, very leery about simmering Chinese greens for too long, okay? But, uh, but yeah, a lot of the chefs in Malaysia, they, they would simmer it a little bit longer than I do. Okay, you see how this is all completely soaked up? Okay. Let's see how we're going for time. Okay, we're doing perfect for time. So what I'm going to do is make a uh, sambal belacan that is typically made fresh, but we're going to fry it up a little bit. Okay, this is a tip from my fellow Masters of Malaysian Cuisine chef, Pearly Key, who is also a member of my Malaysian Street Food Kitchen community. And Pearly says, if you cook it up, she does it in a thermomix. We're not going to do it in a thermomix because I don't want to assume that you need a thermomix to do this. Let's have a go at making it. Okay, we'll use a uh, we'll use a, a blender to blend the uh, to blend the the, the 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 chilies. But then we're going to try and cook it up a little bit. Okay, and see how it shows up. Pearly swears by it. But usually when I make sambal blachan, I make the, the fried sambal blachan with the onion and um, you've seen me make it a number of times in my, in my, in my cooking videos, I hope. <laughs> okay. So you see what I mean about braising it? Okay. I think it could actually be even darker. But the noodles have held up beautifully, so thank you, Changs, <laughs> for this. Mark, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> I was just telling people, Mark, this is a recipe from my last trip to Malaysia. My own kale hokkien noodle recipe used to contain oyster sauce, but this one does not. And the less ingredients you need for this, the better, really, in my opinion. Okay. So voila, it's gonna like, um, you see how it looks at the moment? It could actually be 
even less saucy okay so we're just gonna let it sit by itself for a little bit but let's hop on to attempt to make the chili that i was telling you about okay so i've got some frozen but by chilies here okay we're gonna blend this just give me a second i might get some uh, fresh last chilies as well So these are some fresh last chilies that are looking a little bit sad in my fridge. I'm going to... Now typically when you make fresh sambal blachan, right, you would actually um, use chilies and you'll pound them in a mortar and pestle and then you would Uh, add like separately toasted blachan shrimp paste to it, okay? And then you'll finish it off. You'll add a little bit of salt, you know, if you want maybe a pinch of sugar. And then you'll finish it off with a, a squeeze of lime or lemon juice, right? So that's your typical fresh sambal blachan, which will go quite well with this. Um, but we're going to try and make it without the use of mortar and pestle. But instead, we're going to cook it up with a little bit of oil, okay? Let's see how it turns out. Like I said, a uh, pearly key of uh, Penang Yonya home, uh, home Cooking School. Penang Home Cooking School, she's a Nyonya expert. If, a, if it's good enough for a Nyonya chef, it you know should be pretty decent, okay? So I'm using some of my frozen and defrosted bird's eye chilies. Let's see how it turns out. And guys, I just want to announce, uh, next weekend is the launch of my Masters of Malaysian Cuisine project. And um, in lieu of this particular broadcast, I'm going to be going live in Masters of Malaysian Cuisine. And it's going to be seven days of eight different chefs going live every day. And these are the biggest names in Malaysian cooking around the world. Okay, so we're talking about Johari Idros, who was the Master Chef Malaysia judge, the main judge over five seasons we have uh, Norman Musa who is a multi uh, TV host award-winning author cookbook author and also a chef over in the Netherlands you've got yours truly <laughs> you've got uh, Pearly Key and you've got vegan chef Dave who's gone viral in Malaysia over the last week or so last couple of weeks with his amazing work and inspirational story so we've got all these all these different chefs we've got uh, Nora Harun, who's actually Singaporean but based in the based in California, and she does such amazing work with Malaysian flavors and Malaysian food that we could not turn her down just on the basis of a technicality that she was born in Singapore. She's still an, a master of Malaysian cooking, right? So all of us are going to go live, and also we have Renee Jufri. Renee is actually on paternity leave, so we'll have a guest chef, a special guest chef, to replace Renee for this particular. Uh, for this particular batch of live videos but we will bring him back in our next batch so once a month for an entire week we're all each going to go live each day and we're going to show you how to produce fantastic malaysian food regardless where you're based in the world because like i said we are based on all around the world and we're going to show you our own like take on malaysian food and malaysian flavors as well okay so i've got some some of this here let's blitz this and this is going to be a little bit loud okay ended up with. Let's scrape it into a pan. Interesting to see if my nose starts uh, <laughs> running because of all the chili. Okay, so like I said, pearly would typically add some oil to this and fry it up in here, okay? 
This, by the way, is a Thermocook Pro M. It's like a Thermomix, but a different brand. So if you want, you can actually cook in it instead of scraping this out into a pan to do this. Next step, you could just add oil in here and then set it to stir and cook for you, okay? But obviously, I'm going to assume not everyone has one of these. Again, if you've been following my broadcast, you know I've been talking to the company about offering one of these as a giveaway to one of you guys. We're still working out the details. So thanks for your patience. But uh, make sure you sign up to bit.ly slash Jackie M. Cookalong if you want to find out more about this and other giveaways that I have for my audience on a regular basis, okay? Okay, so this looks pretty potent. <laughs> Look at all the chili seeds, okay? So like I say, if you're making sambal, fresh sambal, you would typically stick this in a mortar and pestle and pound it, okay? So he says, you can cook it, add a little bit of oil. Doesn't have to be too high a heat. And I'm going to get some of my belachan. Alright, so if you were doing this fresh and you were using fresh belachan, you will want to separately toast the belachan. Um, I actually use belachan powder a lot of the time, so about belachan, right? Obviously, this isn't the only brand, but this was the first one I ever came across running a food business. So what it is, if you actually were using fresh belachan, you will cut out a, a chunk of it and then you'll toast it either under a grill wrapped in foil. Basically, you want to uh, break it down until it turns crumbly and has all the flavors like kind of like come to the fore, right? You buy it in a powder form, it basically means that it's already been done for you, okay? So... You can like mince the chili more fine if you want, right? This is just kind of there wasn't a lot of it for the uh, for the thermal mix for the thermal cook pro M to grab. But uh, if you blitz it longer or you add more of it for it to 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 whip up, it will be more fine. Okay, but this is this is okay. So again, bit of oil in here. I like to add a hint of sugar. <laughs> and a bit of salt. And the blachan, okay? Sprinkle of blachan. And let's taste test this a little bit. Very spicy. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more blachan. Okay. You add a little bit of water if you want. Just quite dry. So this should not taste outright sweet. The sugar is just to cut through some of the, the savouriness, right? And then put a little bit of lemon juice. Gonna open it up first. Okay. So voila. See so a quick fresh in like uh inverted commas summer blood All the all the sauce should be soaked up into the noodles. It should not be swimming in sauce and the noodles look dark, okay? 
So there you go. Let's dish this up. If you're cooking along at home, guys, I'd love to see your photos. Right. A little bit of chili here on the side. Let me just scrape it over. Let me just get something clean it up. Okay. So there you go. All right. Does that look easy now? Hey guys, so that's your KL Pocket Noodles. Give it a shot. Don't forget to sign up to my email list, bit.ly slash Jackie M Cook Along to get the recipe sent out to you. I'm going to see you next time, alright guys? Uh, watch out for my announcement about the Malaysian um, Masters of Malaysian Cuisine Cook Alongs. I'll announce it on social media. Thanks again guys, I'll see you later.